I did not have the power to say no. Challenges. There's no denying we all have them. These are the stories of ordinary people facing extraordinary challenges and emerging better on the other side. I'm Cheryl Hunter. As a teenager, I was kidnapped and held captive. Today, my mission is to let you know that you are bigger than anything that can ever come your way. Join us for these extraordinary stories and be reminded that your true nature is to rise. Do you ever feel like the decks are stacked against you? Well, if you've ever felt that way, I invite you to watch this next story. Tell me what your childhood was like before it changed. I grew up in a very happy home in Kenya. We were three in a family at that particular time. Uh, with a stay-home mom, solid family, everything was just perfect. It was something that would change your own teen years. What was that? The down spiral of it started when I was 11, when I had to undergo female genital mutilation. Um, being born and raised in the city, that is not something that I thought would happen to me. So that was the initial uh, starting point of feeling ashamed because I didn't want my peers to know that I did go through that. You said that because you were living in the city, this was something that was unusual. How did it happen to you? My grandmother had spoken about um, female genital mutilation, that at the passage of being a girl to being a woman, and it was her desire for me to undergo through that uh, pro procedure. So my mother felt it was a curse if I didn't have to go through that. And so she hid it from my father and had another lady take me to, to have the process done to me. So to be clear, your mother th thought that it would be a curse if you did not have it done? She believed something, would, something bad would happen to me if I did not undergo the procedure. And the reason why I say it's something to be ashamed of, especially being in the city, city girls didn't go through th those kind of procedures. That's what I believed. Uh, mostly it's the girls who were in the village who underwent female genital mutilation. What did your mother believe would befall you if you did not undergo female genital mutilation? She gave me an example of a woman in the village who had ended up paralyzed on one side of the body and they believed it was as a result of a curse. So she was afraid that similar things would happen to me. And that woman who was paralyzed on one side of her body had no female genital mutilation? No. Got it. Mm -hmm. So how did you then hide that? You said you wanted to hide it from your peers in the city. How did you do that? When I came back from the procedure, it was not something that was talked about that had happened to me. So I stayed indoors. I locked myself in my house and I would not get out of the house only at night to go use the restroom. And during the day, I would use, you know, a bucket in the house. Yeah, what do you mean? You used a bucket to urinate? Mm -hmm. Where was this procedure done? In Nairobi. It's in the east side of Nairobi, a little small house. Uh, and there was there's an old lady who actually does the procedures. What was going through your mind once this was, once you were taken there? Fear. I was afraid, um, afraid of bleeding to death, afraid of the curse that had been, you know, the fear that had been instilled in me that if I don't do this, something wrong was going to happen. So fear pretty much ruled over me at that particular time. There's an adult who's also taking me to the procedure and telling me this is this has to happen. Once you realized you were going to live and that you weren't in fact going to bleed to death, mm -hmm. then what was on your mind? Anger. I was angry at my mother. I was angry that there was nobody to protect me from that. I was angry because I felt it was not right. It was a, no one should have to go through that. Learning what I had learned in school, I did not see the value of what was done to me. So I was angry. But when I graduated from high school and I got pregnant, so I ended up being a mother at the age of 17. And so my teen, I never really got to enjoy my teen years because in between getting pregnant and the female genital mutilation, my mother suffered depression when I was in my third year of high school. So I took on the role of becoming a mother to my younger brother and my sister. 
two months after I had my baby, I had to go back to school and I studied uh, business administration with some secretarial skills. As soon as I was done with that accelerated program, uh, I was sexually violated by a family friend, so he raped me and I got pregnant again. And here I am now at the age of 19 with two babies, you know, shame, more shame upon me. I already had one, which was taboo in those days. Having a child out of wedlock was really looked down upon. So I had not only had I brought shame to myself, I had brought shame to the entire family. And my father was really uh, hurt and wounded and frustrated. And he would say negative things to me. He would call me names that even continued to just wound me. And I would carry on this shame more and more and more. So that was pretty much my teenage years. And knowing what you had suffered, you made a declaration. What was that declaration? My first declaration was I would never allow my daughters to go through what I went through. My second declaration was to make sure that I become a better mother, fight for my girls, and not just my girls, but also other girls, be a voice and speak on that, and, and to provide them a better life than what I ever had. Protect them, protect them, protect them. And so what did you do to that end? My journey started when I decided to venture to come into the U.S. I called my cousin who was living here and I told her I need to find a school, any school, I don't care because I have to do something for my girls. They were already on the same path going to the same elementary school that I went to and I thought this cannot be. I did a fundraiser, I organized my own fundraiser, called upon friends and family, relatives. And I managed to raise uh, money, enough money for an airline ticket and $200 to come to the U.S. to go to school. So you came to the U.S. and then what did you do? I came to the U.S. I looked for a job and while in the process of doing that, a family adopted me here and they put me through school. And while I was in school, they also made a way for my daughters to come to the U.S. to join me. So, and Jerry, you've used the circumstances that you went through yes. to now impact the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you're doing that. Well, right now, um, I'm a voice for the voiceless. For that girl in Africa who cannot speak for herself, who cannot share her story, having gone through what I went through, as negative as it was, I can now be able to say this should not happen to our girls. I can be able to also encourage them and tell them there's always hope if you believe you can accomplish anything. I'm currently working on providing feminine hygiene products for the girls in, in Africa because one out of 10 girls in Africa can't afford pads and their education gets affected by that. And if they don't go to school, they're susceptible to being raped or either they will have to trade themselves for pads, so sex for pads. So preventative, I'm trying to help them prevent getting sexually transmitted diseases, but stay in school and prevent them from being raped, you know, because I know how it would feel like to do, to go through something like that. I speak to them, I tell them my story, and I tell them the importance of education. For the mothers, we are providing, you know, small loans, micro loans for them, just like my mother did to raise me, she had a small business, I believe in empowering mothers. If you provide them with something, a seed money, they can take it and duplicate it and grow and be able to educate their daughters and be able to provide for their children. So that is my biggest goal right now. You mentioned that there's quite a lot of taboo around the subject. Mm -hmm. Would you say something about that? Menstrual hygiene is not something that a father can sit down with the daughter and talk about. That's something a mother has to teach the daughters. And we've seen a problem where you, you don't talk about periods in the open. You don't talk about periods, especially when men are around. This is such a private issue, private talk. If men find out that you've had your periods, to them it equates you become a woman, even at, at a very early age. So growing up, we, we were not talked to talk about this issue. Even my own brothers could not know when I was on my periods. I had to hide that because it's, it's, it's dirty. And that's the reason why. That mentality is still there. And if the start of menstruation heralds that a girl has become a woman, what is the other problem? That means the men can now prey on them sexually because to them you're prime, you're ready. If you're menstruating, you're a woman and we can go after you sexually. 
So it's all the more reasons. The more reasons to right. hide it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what specifically are you making for them or providing for them? We provide washable reusable pads. We also provide uh, menstrual hygiene cups. And the reason we provide sustainable products is because there are so many millions of girls who don't have these uh, resources. So we cannot continue buying on a monthly basis. If we can give them something that will last longer, then we can be able to have this solution taken and meet masses of girls instead of a few girls at a time. Jerry, you are a walking, breathing example that it is possible to turn your difficulties into gold and to furthermore pay it forward and impact the lives of others. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for shining the light and showing the way. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for having me. That notion that speaking out and raising our voices is a path to freedom is such an inspiring and empowering one that's ever so relevant today.